To all you heroes out there, this is Ryan, the original outlaw of the airwaves, bringing you another episode of Hero Paranormal Podcast. With all that is going on with virus frenzy, coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, it's another plague, another drama, another issue in the human experience. This is very trying for all of us, and you all have to remember that you are the heroes in the story, the story being this life that we're living. And I'm very excited to talk about history too, because this, these types of things happen over and over again. We, we know that we've dealt with other issues and we're going to delve into, um, a little bit of American history, United States history, and how it has been woven into the fabric of our school system and other things and how some believe things that just, well, probably aren't true. And I'm, I'm extremely excited for our guest today. He is a writer, an editor. He's currently working on a number of exciting projects. Among other things, uh, you may know him from jasoncolavito.com. He also manages the website thelostcivilizations.com. He is an author and editor and skeptical xenoarchaeologist specializing in the intersection of horror fiction and science fiction and also pseudoscience. He's an author of several books, including The Cult of Alien Gods and Jason and the Argonauts Through the Ages. He is, well, very knowledgeable about many, many things, and I've wanted to talk to him for a very long time, so this is a real treat for me. We are going to attack an issue that really gets to the core of those who can, well, sway the masses into believing things they want them to believe. Now, this is not current events. However, it does have some issues with current events because not much has changed as far as the governed and the governing. The governing body is able to insert myth into reality and therefore create a history which truly isn't real. We've all heard about fake news and how the media can literally create a crisis out of nothing. They can create history out of nothing and basically sway the mindset of the governed or you and I. Anyway, this is going to be a great podcast. I just know it. Jason Colavito is knowledgeable in this aspect more than just about anyone I know. His book is truly amazing. It's a, it's a work that has to be read. What we're going to delve into is The Mound Builders and The Mound Builder Myth. It's a book I highly recommend. You can go to Amazon and find it. Just look up Jason Colavito, The Mound Builder Myth, History and the Hunt for a Lost White Race. I'm going to read a little bit about what we're going to get into. Let's say this is about the book. And let's say you found that a few dozen people operating at the highest levels of society conspired to create a false ancient history of the American continent to promote a religious white supremacist agenda in the service of supposedly patriotic ideals. Would you call it fake news? In 19th century America, this was, in fact, powerful truth that shaped Manifest Destiny. The Mound Builder Myth is the first book to chronicle the attempt to recast the Native American burial mounds as the work of a lost white race of true Native Americans. Thomas Jefferson's pioneering archaeology concluded that the earthen mounds were the work of Native Americans. In the 1894 report of the Bureau of American Ethnology, Cyrus Thomas concurred, drawing on two decades of research. But in the century in between, the lie took hold. 
with Presidents Andrew Jackson, William Henry Harrison, and Abraham Lincoln adding their approval and the Mormon Church among those benefiting. Jason Colavito traces this monumental deception from the furthest reaches of the frontier to the halls of Congress, mapping a century-long conspiracy to fabricate and promote a false ancient history, and enumerating its devastating consequences for the contemporary Native people. Built upon primary sources and first-person accounts, the story that the Mound Builder myth tells is a forgotten chapter of American history, but one that reads like the Da Vinci Code, as it plays out at the upper reaches of government, religion, and science. And as far-fetched as it now might seem that a lost white race once ruled prehistoric America, the damage done by this ancient myth has clear echoes in today's arguments over white nationalism, multiculturalism, alternative facts, and the role of science and the control of knowledge in public life. And with that, Jason Colavito, welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. It's great to be here. I'm, I'm super excited to talk about uh, these mounds and how the very few um, elite, it seems like in the past, had an agenda with what the uh, average American thought about these mounds and, and, and what started you on this journey, Jason? Well, I've been interested in strange ideas about history for a very long time. I've written several books on the subject and have written a blog about it for uh, more than 10 years now. Uh, but the mound builder myth in particular was specifically interesting to me because it was a story of odd history and strange ideas that was happening practically in my own backyard. I grew up in a small town in upstate New York, and in the center of town was one of these mounds that had a, a legend about an old Indian and a curse and all of that sort of thing. And it was the same area of upstate New York where the Mormons uh, originated and where they first told the story about the uh, mound that they believed held the remains of the lost races that had populated the United States before uh, the time of Christ. So, and after, I suppose, their timeline is uh, stretches into the Middle Ages, I guess. But um, it was a story that I've always been aware of, and that's always been around me for uh, my whole life. And I wanted to explore it in detail and take a uh, deeper look at where those ideas came from, how they developed, and the consequences that they had for the people who lived in that era of the 19th century when the mound builder myth was at its height. Uh, today, we you know kind of see the mound builder myth as uh, a weird thing that happened in the past, but despite the fact that there are still people who believe very strongly in the idea that the mounds were built by some kind of lost race of giants or Europeans or something like that. Um, the real devastating consequences of that story took place in the 19th century when the United States government actually endorsed some of those ideas and used them as a justification for acts of cultural and even physical genocide against Native Americans. Wow, that is wild. And you speak about the consequences that it had for the people of the time, Jason. Um, what what type of was it? Mostly the Native Americans that felt those consequences, or were there other consequences as well felt? Well, the story of the Mound Builder myth is really the story of how the United States tried to create an imaginary past for itself to rival the ancient history of Europe. And in the 18th and 19th centuries, white Americans were the ruling class of the United States. But there was a profound sense that because the United States was such a young country, that it didn't have the deep roots, uh, the deep connection to the land that the Europeans had in Europe. When the Europeans could speak of uh, the Roman Empire and of the um, Germanic hordes and all of the great peoples of the past, the United States wanted to separate itself from that European heritage, but also to have that kind of deep connection to what had happened before. So white Americans sort of created this myth that there had been a white race that inhabited the United States before the Native Americans came. And therefore, white Americans were simply restoring the United States to its previous ancient greatness. 
And one of the consequences for that was to use that idea to justify removing Native Americans from territories that were occupied by white Americans. This ultimately resulted in the Trail of Tears. Now, it's not that the myth specifically caused this. White Americans wanted to get rid of the Native Americans anyway. But this kind of bad history, bad historiography, and um, frankly racist ideology helped to push those ideas along and help to amplify and justify those actions by appealing to an imaginary past that never was. I see, I see the motivation and I can see how, you know, this land isn't theirs, it's really ours, would echo in the minds of settlers. In, you, you mentioned that this, this word got back to Europe. And I guess my yeah. question is, it's amazing how easily this was done and how it took root in our history and people started to believe it and people actually still do believe it. How, how did this happen with such ease? Well, it's not that it was an easy process. If you go back to the late 18th century in the 1780s, you have people like Thomas Jefferson who actively investigated mounds and correctly concluded that they were the work of Native Americans. And in fact, right up until around that time, that was the widespread and accurate belief. People knew and understood where the mounds came from and how they'd been built and educated people around the world at it had no problem attributing them to Native Americans. It was really the motivation, the sort of motivated reasoning led from the highest parts of the United States government and from elite academic institutions. Uh, you see it in the works of several presidents, Andrew Jackson among them, um, and Harrison. You see it also coming from the Smithsonian Institution. It's that sort of elite acceptance of the fake idea, and the gradual accumulation of arguments in favor of white mound builders or giant mound builders, or um, they also attributed them to Toltecs and Vikings and all sorts of uh, other people. But it's this motivated reasoning that when we propose this idea, then it has good consequences for us, so let's accept it, that you see it's a gradual process that begins to snowball. And eventually it reaches a critical mass. So while at first it was just a couple of um, important people advocating for this idea, more and more of them begin to accept it as the 1790s turn into the 1800s and the 1810s, until finally it reaches a point where not accepting it puts you in the minority. And at that point, it sort of spirals and becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that people believed because other people were believing. And if you found evidence that went against that, well, you didn't want to tell anybody because it would start to jeopardize your position in elite society. Because if you were saying, well, Native Americans built the mounds, well, who are you? Are you against white people? Are you some kind of person who's in favor of Native Americans? And nobody wanted that back then. So what you see is that there, that social pressure develops to believe in an idea that only a few decades earlier, everyone knew wasn't true. And that kind of elite social pressure coming from the very top levels of academia, from government, from society, trickles down and reinforces the, uh, the notion that the mound builders are somehow different, other, uh, not Native American, in order to justify the uh, political and social policies that were advocating against Native American interests. It is absolutely fascinating, Jason. There, There is a mention that this not only uh, benefited, but may have included the uh, Mormon church at the time. How, how did that take place? Well, the early history of Mormonism is, of course, um, somewhat disputed because there's the official version given out by the uh, Latter-day Saints, and there's also the less credulous version that mainstream historians uh, might prefer. If you are a believer, you would believe that the story that the Mormons told is uh, that an angel came down and showed Joseph Smith where to find ancient records of the lost mound builders, and that 
in so doing, Smith learned that they were um, the lost tribes of Israel who had colonized the future United States a long time ago. If you are not a believer and don't subscribe to the angel theory, it is more likely that what you see in the story of Mormonism is an effort to reflect the larger trends in society and create a religion for the United States based on the emerging new history that was being created for the ancient land that would become the United States. So in the Book of Mormon, you see references. Now, he doesn't specifically talk about mounds in the Book of Mormon, but he refers to um, the Lost Tribes and to uh, other elements of the mound building myth that uh, are widespread in the literature of the era. Other books that were published in the years leading up to the Book of Mormon talk about mound builders and uh, their connection to the lost tribes of Israel, how the mounds might have been the work of ancient Jews, and so on. So what Joseph Smith does is he takes these ideas and he recasts them in religious terms. Not only is the United States the place where the lost tribes of Israel hung out, a claim that went back to the 1600s, but the United States is now a holy land that is sanctified by this translation of the um, the lost tribes to the United States by the arrival of Jesus in the United States and so on. So what you see is the mound builder myth becoming part of a foundation to help take uh, old world religious ideas and recast them in a new world context. Yeah, I totally see how that could merge and, and work very, very smoothly um, in that time period. Controversy over how much of Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon is original to him and how much has been, shall we say, repurposed from earlier books um, that were written in the decade or so leading up to the Book of Mormon. And uh, we don't really want to get into all of the details of that because that's incredibly complicated textual question and uh, also gets people really upset. But um, there is definitely a similarity. And at the very least, you can see that there was a widespread uh, set of ideas about lost tribes and mound builders that were um, present and uh, popular in that time period. Yes. And there's, you know, there, there was some significance for other cultures as well. I noticed that, uh, you know, you, you hear about Huiracocha and you hear uh, in Peru and throughout Central America, there, each culture has its own version of a tale. And it seems like at that time period about the cross and the mound in 1540, that if you could tell our listeners a little bit about that, I think it's fascinating. I, um, at the beginning of my book, I tell the story of Hernan de Soto and his um, journey across the southern United States and the mounds that he encountered on the way. Um, de Soto ran across a mound and um, what he did was he put a cross on top of it and claimed it for Christianity. And it was uh, sort of symbolic of the European effort to claim mounds um, in favor of uh, Christianity and European culture. It's a process that would be repeated across the United States uh, for centuries to come, where mounds were repurposed as places for Europeans. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of uh, the podcast, in my hometown there was a mound in the center of town, and it's located inside a cemetery. And that's one of the most uh, popular reuses for mounds um, in the early uh, colonial era because they were believed to be burial mounds for Native Americans. Uh, they were repurposed as centerpieces for early cemeteries and Europeans and European Americans would bury their dead in and around it in a way to uh, sort of symbolically claim the territory for themselves. So it's really a case of people claiming you know, things that weren't theirs as their own. This has happened over and over again. There were individuals at the time who were uh, believing in this quite f 
fervently, but there are still at this time period, people who believe this to this day. Could we go into that a little bit? Sure. There is a, a concerted effort among a small minority of people to continue to push the mound builder myth. And many of those are what I would call fringe history types uh, or pseudo history types. And the people who are interested in ancient mysteries, um, basically, if you could see it on the History Channel, it's probably uh, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> uh, when you see shows like Ancient Aliens or Search for the Lost Giants or those sorts of odd programs that make really wild and extreme claims about history, they're reflecting that particular subculture's beliefs. There are people who continue to push the mound builder myth, even though the idea that the mounds were built by giants or Europeans or what have you was almost conclusively debunked in the 1890s. Now, more than a century later, we see that those the older ideas from before that time keep getting recycled in somewhat popular books about uh, ancient mysteries and odd claims. Um, for example, there is a uh, Christian blogger, podcaster, YouTube star, etc., named L.A. Marzulli, who promotes a, an evangelical Christian agenda. And part of that is the search for what he called the Nephilim, uh, who are the giants from the book of Genesis. And he uses old ideas from the mound builder myth to claim that the mounds are not the work of Native Americans, but were part of the Nephilim culture. And therefore, the United States is part of this worldwide um, Nephilim society that was wiped out by the Great Flood. The idea, of course, is to connect the land back to the Bible, and therefore, sort of, in this sort of inverted way, demonically, so to speak, um, cast the United States as part of the biblical salvation history. If the Nephilim were here, then the United States must be part of the great story being told in the Bible, even though it's not you know, specifically mentioned anywhere in the Bible on account of not being known at the time. So that's one area where um, modern types are pursuing mound builder stories. But another area where that happens are the so-called gigantologists who are looking for giants somewhere, anywhere in history. Their motivations tend to be mixed. Some of them are interested in pursuing a Christian agenda like the Nephilim theorists. Some of them are simply looking for unusual and oddball ideas. And more than a few of them pursue giants out of a distrust of academia and a fear that social elites are trying to impose an agenda that they disagree with. So there are a lot of reasons that people are hunting for giants, but many of them decide that because 19th century people believed that the mounds were the work of giants, that therefore 20th and 21st century elites are hiding that truth and that the giant story must be true on account of it being old. So there is a, uh, a large contingent of people who, especially online, put up YouTube videos and write blog posts and um, online articles advocating for this. But when you look into their research, it's almost always reliant on these old 19th century ideas that originally grew out of 19th century racism. It is so true that uh, some of these ideas are still held by really elite circles, and I don't want to go into names, but it seems like some very powerful individuals still believe a lot of this stuff. Why is it so uh, pervasive among these higher circles? Well, that depends on what you're defining as elite. <laughs> if you're talking about people on the History Channel as being elite, then I suppose that might be the case, but... I'm not aware of any actual academic or political elites who believe in mound builder myths today. Yeah, it's more it's more archaeological organizations and uh, wealthy members within those that that comes to mind. But you're absolutely right. There's, but it seems that in certain circles, these strange ideas are considered reality. There are certainly some wealthy people who have very odd ideas, and there are 
individuals who have put a lot of time and effort and money into trying to prove them true. I wouldn't say that there is any sort of elite organization hunting giants, but, um, and, and certainly mainstream archaeologists have no interest in pursuing this particular line on account of it, you know, not being true. But um, that hasn't stopped some of the people who are behind um, the books that become bestsellers and the TV shows that promote these ideas from embracing some of the odder ideas of history. And it's an open question why anyone would particularly fall victim to these extreme ideas. I mean, it's often, there are often accusations hurled that people who believe in this must be racist and are trying to um, oppose Native Americans. I don't think that it's the case that most people are explicit, who believe in this are explicitly being racist so much as that they're not aware of where the ideas came from or how they were used in the past or the lack of uh, actual evidence that uh, supported them at the time that they were proposed. So my sense is that the racist ideas you see in it tend to be more structural because of when and how these ideas were created. They bring with them certain assumptions and certain consequences that their modern advocates don't always fully appreciate or consider. Yes. And, do you, do you think that these beliefs in strange things like the giants, uh, like, and there's, there's a lot of other things that go along with that. I know that in Utah where I, I grew up, um, for a lot of my life, the giants are just kind of a thing that was somewhat accepted as, oh, it's probably true. And that they were in caves in Utah and it's very pervasive. It's certainly the case that old ideas tend to linger on. So ideas that were popular among the elites in the 19th century trickle down and become part of the common folklore. And we see this not just in this particular case, but across the spectrum that what were cutting edge ideas 100 or 150 years ago sort of trickle down and become folk magic and folk beliefs um, later on until finally they <laughs> reemerge on the internet. But uh, what we see is that people don't always have access to the latest and best information. And there's sort of a lag time culturally between what is the cutting edge research going on in academia and what we see on the street. So when people talk about strange ideas, they have this sense that they were once accepted and were once um, prestigious. And so they sort of continue on. Uh, when you read uh, popular books about giants and mounds and that sort of thing, you see this constant appeal to the authority of 19th century scientists because their reputation sort of follows down the centuries. And even though their ideas were wrong, their long ago reputation as the great men of science and as the serious scholars of the day sort of gives their old outdated ideas this air of sanctity and their, this air that um, there's something profound to those ideas, even though they were proven wrong. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit different line here. I wanted to ask you about the Jefferson Mound and um, was it John Bartram? Could you tell our listeners a little bit about that and the ins and outs of how interesting that uh, situation arose? Well, Thomas Jefferson, uh, there was a mound that he knew of on uh, the property that would eventually become Monticello. And he uh, knew about it from the time that he was a kid. And eventually he decided that he would want to dig into the mound and see what was inside. So uh, Thomas Jefferson actually invented much of what we would recognize today as archaeology as part of his investigation into the mound. He conducted one of the first carefully controlled excavations in world history. Uh, by comparison, the Europeans were simply digging holes and trying to extract as much treasure as possible. 
and Jefferson was carefully cutting perfectly straight lines through the mound to study the stratigraphy and removing layers very carefully to try to um, evaluate each layer of construction. So Thomas Jefferson um, set the template for modern archaeology and investigating the mound, and he was the one who was able to determine for the first time in scientific detail all of the evidence that shows why the mound had been built by Native Americans. And one of the most interesting things about that is that even though Thomas Jefferson laid all of this out in exquisite detail in his notes on the state of Virginia, and even though all that information was widely available, it had been reprinted in the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, people didn't want to believe it. And so they made up stories about it. And it took more than 100 years for people to begin excavating mounds scientifically again and coming to the exact same conclusions based on the exact same results. And that testifies to the power of belief over evidence and the convenient lie over the inconvenient truth. Wow. It's just mind blowing. And um, to ask a question about some of these upper echelon societies of the time, many of which still exist and the possibility of basically these ideas being kind of like a, kind of like a secret society in a way. I mean, Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were members of the American philosophical society. And this society continues on to this day. There's no conspiracy involved. There's no secret society holding mound builder and giant beliefs. These ideas weren't secret back then, and they aren't secret now. They were widely published in newspapers, in magazines, in academic journals, in books. Everybody who was anybody in the uh, early 19th century was fully aware of, and many were participants in the conversation about the mound builders. So it wasn't a secret. It was the very first publication of the Smithsonian Institution devoted to the uh, question of who built the mounds and mound exploration. The uh, academic journals were filled with articles about it. The newspapers reported on debates over who was the real builder of the mounds and so on. And the most popular book in the United States, one of the, the best-selling uh, history books of the 1830s, was uh, Josiah Priest's American Antiquities, which was focused largely on the question of which old world cultures we could uh, ascribe ancient American wonders to. So it wasn't a secret in any way, shape, or form. It was the common belief at the time, uh, much the way um, in the 20th century there were beliefs uh well, imagine, say, uh, Freudian psychology, which uh, has largely been replaced. But in the 20th century, everybody knew about Freudian psychoanalysis and uh, all of the odd claims that Sigmund Freud made that were widely accepted by elites and lay people alike. And now, a half century after the heyday of Freudian psychoanalysis, we look back and sort of say, wow, why did people really believe that back then? It's kind of the same idea. There was uh, a widespread, very popular belief, and it infected society from the top to the bottom until one day it didn't. I like that. That's so true. It did infect it. And that top to the bottom trickle down, these ideas were held true by lost races of mound builders or giants or that sort of thing. Correct. Cor and Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin didn't believe it. Uh, later people thought he did because um, a guy forged a, uh, a document alleging that Benjamin Franklin had endorsed the Mound Builder myth and thought that a comet had destroyed the Mound Builder civilization. But that was all fake. People believed it because they thought the documents were real, but they weren't. It was just a plagiarism that a uh, French expatriate had uh, written in one of his books. Okay. Yeah. So it may have been a, an issue of history kind of going back and that makes sense. People trying to change it for their own benefit. And that's, you know, fast forwarding to another, you know, somebody who was also a president and a member of some of the same groups as Benjamin Franklin, who pro propagated this was uh, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln, um, in one of his notebooks wrote about, he wrote something that 
somewhat ambiguous because it's not particularly clear, but um, the most obvious reading of his notes on Niagara Falls is that he was referring to the idea that the American mounds were the repositories of the bones of the lost race of giants, the Nephilim. Um, I don't think that particular reference is enough to conclude that he was obsessed with giants or believed in the lost race of mound builders per se, so much as that he was aware of the broader cultural context that was discussing the ideas at the time. And um, whether poetically or not, he included that reference in his discussion of Niagara Falls and the grandeur that he hoped to find there but did not. He was not impressed by Niagara Falls, and he thought that uh, things like mounds were much more interesting. It's it's very interesting that, you know, the belief, I, I can see where it comes, that a prehistoric race that built these elaborate ceremonial rounds um, were in Ohio and Mississippi. And I think uh, in the book it mentions that in Mississippi it kind of reached a grand scale. Well, that was true across the United States at the time. It It's not that it was like a, a panic over uh, the true race of, of mound builders. It's more along the lines of um, what people accept is true. You have to remember that at the time, this is what was being taught in high school textbooks. When kids went to school, they read that the first Americans were a lost race of mound builders who probably came from Europe, were probably white, and that they were just killed off by angry, bloodthirsty Native Americans who deserved to be destroyed. And that's what they were taught in school. So when you talk about people being mad for the idea, that's not really the case so much as it's what they believe because that's what their culture taught them. It was in the textbooks, it was in the newspapers, it was in the magazines. The president of the United States, Andrew Jackson, referred to it. Uh, he alluded to it in the State of the Union address. It was just everywhere. And because it was such a widespread belief promoted at every level of culture, it becomes a pervasive idea that becomes accepted simply because it's ubiquitous. And would you say that Andrew Jackson, as far as presidents is concerned, did the most to try to spread this? In a literal sense, no. Um, President Harrison did a lot more in that he wrote an actual book, uh, it was a a lecture he gave that was published as a book on the subject and was much more um, actively engaged in the question of the true origins of the mounds. But Andrew Jackson unintentionally did more to spread it than anyone else because of his use of those ideas as part of the justification for the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears, the um, legislation and enforcement of the removal of Native Americans from east of the Mississippi across to the Indian Territory and what would become Oklahoma. And that um, the arguments over Indian removal helped to spread ideas of mound builder myths more than almost anything else because they had such a uh, political utility, much the way today's political controversies spawn uh, rapid developments in fake news. Back then, fake history was how you justified the unjustifiable by appealing to a fake historical narrative that Native Americans weren't the original occupants of the land, but were in fact usurpers who had killed off the peaceful, glorious, lost race of mound builders. It, crea <clears throat> it creates the political motivation to push through Indian removal to oppose Native American rights and to seize Native American lands. You're restoring it to the people who it truly belongs to, white Europeans. So while Jackson wasn't um, going around like Harrison and actively um, advocating for, for uh, science to declare the mounds the work of white Europeans, he spread those ideas through his um, allusions to myth, and especially his supporters' use of the myth, to justify passage of the Indian Removal Act. Absolutely. And since 1830, we see some of this today as well, Since, uh, and this can be seen a little bit with, uh, you know, 
widespread panic due to the current coronavirus situation, but we see it in other areas as well. Do you have any advice just for the general listener as to how to avoid these pitfalls? If there were a way to combat fake news, fake history, and bad ideas, I'm sure somebody would have found it by now. Unfortunately, when powerful people are able to shape culture to their own ends, it becomes very difficult to distinguish fact from fiction. And when that happens, it has widespread societal consequences. If you can't trust what people are saying and obvious facts are contradicted by stories, it creates a trust gap that lingers on. And we see that both today and in the uh, 19th century context. One of the consequences of the mound builder myth for um, the public understanding of science is a break between popular belief and academic understanding of history. In the story of the mound builder myth, for a long time, it was the story of how the public and academics work together to create, support, and defend this idea. But at the end of the 19th century, the Smithsonian Institution breaks that connection by conducting a broad survey of American mounds and determining to the satisfaction of almost everyone who was um, highly educated and had the credentials and degrees to follow along that the mounds would work with Native Americans. But the Smithsonian's work was largely confined to the academic elite. They were the ones who could afford the books and could read the books, and they were hardly discussed outside of that academic elite. So from the perspective of the everyday American, it looked like suddenly all of the academics had completely changed their minds and were now telling them that everything they had been taught in school was wrong. So you see this sort of break between the popular understanding of American prehistory, who really built the mounds, and what the professors and the scientists now understood. And that never really healed, that sort of division between popular and scientific understanding. And it wasn't just the story of the mounds that had this happen. Um, Charles Darwin's theory of evolution created a similar break between popular understanding of what it meant to be human and the scientific understanding of human origins. But it's the succession of these breaks between elite academic ideas and popular understanding of history that came one after the next after the next, not just evolution, not just the mounds, but uh, geology, which replaced Noah's flood with uniformitarianism, and even with Sigmund Freud's psychoanalysis, which challenged the understanding of the human mind. All of these breaks come one after the next, after the next, the end of the 19th century. And by the end of that time, you see that popular culture had one set of beliefs and elite academic culture had a different understanding. And throughout the 20th century, these two never really came back together. So a lot of what we see as the division between the so-called elites and the masses, um, what's often characterized as American anti-intellectualism, is really a result of this pretty profound break between science and what people thought they knew um, before these uh, really profound changes occurred. Yeah, gosh, not not a lot has changed since the... Uh... The, the king lived up on the castle and the uh, peasants lived down in the field. You say that it's not that the, the peasants were living in the field and not completely where there is certainly a communication issue where information wasn't being communicated down um, from the elite producers of knowledge down to the consumers of knowledge as cleanly and as uh, well as it could have been. And steps were taken in the 20th century to try to fix that. But um Part of the problem is that the education system didn't keep up with the changes. And even today, when you listen to a lot of the people who advocate for these extreme ideas talk, they're constantly talking about the textbooks are wrong, the textbooks, the textbooks, as though the textbooks were somehow frozen when they were kids in the 1960s. <laughs> and that's part of the problem, that 
once you leave school, for most Americans, that's it. They don't really learn about new ideas and new things. So their understanding gets frozen in whatever the paradigm, whatever the ideas were at the time that they were in school. And given the fact that we don't re hadn't replaced textbooks very uh, regularly in America, um, those ideas might not even have been current in the time they were in school. But for example, when I was in school, we were still using textbooks from the 1960s and I was in school in the 1990s. So they're looking at, you know, a huge lag time between um, the present and where those ideas that people get come from. So it's not that, you know, the peasants are in the field, the elites are just sort of dancing on top of them, but rather that there's a, there are structural issues that are involved in the breakdown between the production of knowledge and its transference to the broader society. Yeah. So from a, from an educational standpoint, this is so reminiscent of the power structure that came from like skull and bones and that closely knit, you know, elite and their beliefs into the CIA. But, um, Jason, you have a lot of, uh, interesting works. And I wanted to ask you what you were currently working on, or if you have any other exciting projects coming along. Well, my current book is called The Mountain Builder Myth from the University of Oklahoma Press. And it is a story about the history of the Mountain Builder Myth and what we can learn from the uh, interesting path that the story took from its origins through the Trail of Tears down to the incomplete efforts of the Smithsonian to set the record straight. I'm also working on a new book on the legends of the pyramids that will look at the strange stories that people have told about the Giza pyramids over the last couple of thousand years and how medieval ideas about the pyramids have shaped a popular understanding of what the Giza pyramids were and what their purpose was. Ancient astronaut story about uh, how aliens were involved it all originates in a medieval story that was invented around 1000 AD. It's been an honor to have you on, Jason. I appreciate you coming on the podcast and telling us more about this. And where can people keep up with you uh, online and support you? Well, it was great speaking with you, too. Uh, you can find me at my website, jasoncolobito.com. And that's where you can find my blog, uh, links to all of my books, and the latest updates on things that I'm working on. There you have it. Jason Colavito, The Mound Builder Myth, and a fake history that's been inserted into our past. Well, keep up with Jason Colavito at jasoncolavito.com. While you're at it, definitely check out heroparanormal.com. In fact, currently we have a giveaway of a Space Wolf Research hoodie. Uh, North Face hoodie, and you can enter that by doing exactly that. Go to HeroParanormal.com or Hero Paranormal on Facebook, like, share, go to YouTube, Hero Paranormal, like and subscribe, and you are automatically entered. Last but not least, sometimes YouTube is a little bit slow to download because of the video aspect. For a quick and easy way to download Hero Paranormal anywhere you may be, Go to heroparanormal.podbean.com. We also have patron availability there for as little as a dollar. And you get it all. So anyway, check us out. Keep listening. Stay safe. Wash those hands. Screw coronavirus. Well, until next time, folks, keep your eyes to the skies, feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. <laughs> Blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evazine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evazine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like an evazine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Look, Vizine for the third eye It's levels and you can catch me where the birds fly Blast off in the time machine Blowing on that light green straight lime of beans Beasy, take it easy what they tell me Boy, I'm so deep, not even Lucifer can help me And I'm going so hard, not even Lucifer can stop me
Two step, I do mines like this. DeLorean, historian, her story, and we partying back to the future like Michael J. Fox. But it ain't gonna change a thing with this pimping. I ain't with that simping. Can't you see we on a mission, baby? Boom, blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like it need Vizine. Blast off, blast off, blast off, blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like it need Vizine.